let's move on to the, the last uh, uh, segment, um, and that is the, the role of tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, in squamous cell uh, carcinoma, and that may uh, dovetail into a conversation about an unenriched group of patients uh, that do not have EGFR mutations and whether there's a role for TKI. Uh, therapy in this group of patients. I I'll set the historical perspective and then maybe um, we can talk about, um, Ed can talk about the, the Lux Lung uh, 8 trial. Um, you know, you look at the data for TKIs in an unenriched patient population, uh, my take is it's been mixed. Uh, we have the BR21 study, which looked at erlotinib compared to best supportive care uh, and a second or third line setting in patients with both adeno and squame did show a survival advantage. Uh, we have to be careful with subset analyses, but there was a subset analysis in the squamous cell population to show that that benefit in survival did carry over. So we had that study that did show TKIs may be beneficial, at least compared to best supportive care uh, in a squamous cell pa uh, patient population. We have the, the Saturn study, which was a maintenance erlotinib study after four cycles of chemotherapy randomized to erlotinib uh, versus uh, uh, best supportive care. And again, in the squamous cell patient population, we did see that that PFS advantage shown in the intention to treat did carry over uh, into the, to the squamous cell patient population. Again, we have to be realistic about what we can glean from subset analyses that aren't powered to show uh, uh, such effects. Um, I guess counter to that has been the TKI versus the docetaxel story That's in the right. second line. Uh, and we saw uh, data from the Taylor trial uh, showing you know, superiority of docetaxel over a TKI for a specific group of patients who are EGFR wild. And I think in the subset of patients who had squamous, um, there was a benefit with docetaxel uh, or that approach statistical significance. Um, I would argue that the, the, the benefits seen have to be weighed in the context of toxicities or the discrepant toxicities between these two drugs. Nevertheless, it seemed in the Taylor and even the Delta study, subset analysis from the squamous cell patient population seemed to favor cytotoxic chemotherapy over TKI. So, a little lot, a lot of uh, conflicting data. I think this is a contentious area to use or not to use TKIs in patients that don't harbor EGFR mutations. Um, we've come a long way in, in, in molecular testing and delivering TKI up front for these patients. Question really is, do these drugs have any benefit or any clinically meaningful benefit in, in a patient population that is not historically harboring EGFR mutations, particularly squamous cells? So, Lots to cover. Um, Ed, maybe you can talk yeah. about the Lux Lung 8 trial and then maybe your perspectives on the use of this drug. Yeah, and I think you get a nice overview there. I, I will add that, you know, being the PI of interest, which was a, a you know, Jafitinib versus Docetaxel 1400 patient study that showed 7.9 months survival versus 8.1 in a non inferiority fashion, wasn't good enough to get that drug approved. Um, I think we have to go back and thank ISIL for everything we have today. And why do I say that? ISIL was a negative study. That was uh, Jafitnib versus Best Supportive Care. Nick Thatcher reported that. And it missed by two weeks in, in the subset. And what that, what that chain of reaction occurred was that IPASS, which was the first line Jafitnib versus carboplatin paclitaxel study, which was going to be a global Western trial because of the subset indications found in ISIL of the negative, the never smokers and the Asians, got shipped to Asia. <laughs> and that's why the biomarker component of, I, of IPASS was a exploratory. It was right. just in Asian female never smokers, and right. boom, Dang we got lucky. Right. Awesome. So that leads us to today of all these head-to-heads that are ongoing. Everybody, you know, we have three drugs in this space right now, a Jafitnib, or Lotnib, a Fatnib, and, and now, you know, even, Tigriso or osimertinib has some coverage in this area as well, although that it, we wouldn't use that up front right now because it is a uh, targets T790. But uh, Luxlung 8 was, uh, was a large study, 795 patients in squamous, again, of fatinib versus erlotinib. It was worldwide. <clears throat> Jean-Charles Soria pr presented this data, and you know, everything was a little bit more favorable in the afatinib side. And this is a pattern that we're seeing, uh, maybe because it's a newer generation drug. We've, we've seen this as well when afatinib goes against a jafitinib. Uh, and it, it goes to show you that a drug that was thought to be very toxic, that no one could tolerate, at 40 milligrams is pretty tolerable. And dose reducing it to 30 or to 20 is very simple, just like what we do with erlotinib, going from 50 to 100 to 75. Uh, and so when you see these incremental benefits head-to-head -head in a population that's supposed to be equal, 
then I, I think it makes us open our eyes a little bit because that might be the little sway that you choose one drug or another. We, we frankly are impressed with the deletion 19 data uh, it, with a fatinib. Um, we don't think that necessarily that's not the case with some of the others. We're just asking for the data and want to see it, and we haven't seen it yet. And right. so the more data like this, like Lux Lung 8 and Lux Lung 7, that begins to accumulate, you start thinking, well, maybe a fatinib is a preferred drug up front with, uh, especially in deletion 19 patients. Okay. Paul, your thoughts? Uh, you know, clearly, I, 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 this is very controversial. I, I have uh, been on the side of using TKIs as a second or third line in an unenriched group of patients who can't tolerate chemotherapy. And for my practice, that's been uh, a fair amount. Um, nevertheless, um, a lot of conflicting data. Your, your experience with a fatinib uh, in a squamous cell population, or even TKI, and, and should it be something that we consider at some point? So I think. Uh, it's probably easiest uh, because of the data to address Lux Lung 8 specifically. So, the and I'm glad you brought up ISIL and you brought BR21 before because that exercise that people did through ISIL and BR21 in terms of looking at subsets, clinical characteristics that that trended towards improvement for or had significant improvements in certain subsets that make sense now in retrospect, you know, women, Asians, never smokers. Um, so it's important to know that the lung, lung A population was not homogeneous. There was about a five to six percent rate of never smokers, of non pure squamous lung cancers producing the adenocarcinomas. And if you look at the subset analysis in terms of clinical characteristics, the improvements trended towards favoring these subgroups, much like they did for ISIL and BR21. And I think in terms of a table one thing, that's your first uh, foray into um, asking, well, what really is going on here? And then you get to the discussion where they report a 6% each of our mutation rate in each arm, the afatinib and erlotinib arm. And then you have to wonder, well, okay, there was a 6% uh, each of our mutation rate in each arm. What exactly is going on? You had a 6% overall response rate for the afatinib arm and 3% for the erlotinib arm. It, or is the benefit being driven by this subset of patients? The discussion mentioned that because each of our mutations were balanced, this did not explain the difference in efficacy between afatinib and erlotinib. But I would argue that's not the right question to ask. In this day and age where we're used to, and we've talked about this at length during this session, picking a biomarker and then a drug, it stands to reason that we would like to see data that shows what the response rates are in that population and in that population that did not have that alteration. In other words, is the benefit overall just being driven by that small cohort that had each of our mutations. And so for me, until I see that data, the Luxlinate study is in a gray area. I think it is right. In aggregate, where we like to be dogmatic, there are no EGFR, classical each of our mutations detected in TCGA's analysis. And in the sequencing we've done, we really have not seen at any great frequency each of our mutations. The pathway is still there. Amplification still, is occur, still occurs. There's e efficacy with Nessie. There was with Cetuximab. There is probably something that's there. We just don't know what right. it is. And that legwork, I still think, needs to be done for a drug that's going to be expensive, whose benefit still is not that great uh, mm -hmm. overall. And I'm glad you mentioned Taylor and Delta in terms of chemotherapy versus um, uh, each of our TKI. So I think at best this shifts a TKI really down the road. Uh, I would not, um, you know, I myself have not been using each of our TKI as a result. You know, we've been sequencing squamous patients now routinely for about a few years. So if I detect an each of our mutation, which we have on occasion, then we'll offer it pretty soon, you know, in terms of the treatment course. Uh, but absent that, I really have not routinely been giving a TKI. Part of this is philosophical, part of it is not, um, but that's sort of the, the way that I've come okay. down. I think really where the TKIs have gone in squamous has been kind of like how before we had mutations in first in, uh, in exactly non-squam. Right. Yes. It's been that poor performance status, can't give right. them chemo, getting close to hospice, let's give it to them there. Yeah, and right. I think that's really where they're subsetted right yeah. now. So both of you would, would, would uh, fall in line with uh, uh, using a TKI after all other op options are exhausted or a patient who has not tolerated chemotherapy? I, I think you have checkpoint inhibitors and you have uh, docetaxel ramacirumab in patients who can tolerate that. Uh, you know, would I sort of toss up single agent gem versus a TKI probably at that point because we're in third or fourth line? So. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that given in light of all the newer options we have 
and, and drugs that have shown survival advantages that TKIs have been bumped for me. I, I have had some, some clinical scenarios where I've used them as third line. I have, just for instance, a patient who really got beat up on chemotherapy frontline and, and swore to me and himself he would never go back to chemo. We gave him immunotherapy. He's doing very well. He keeps telling me once this drug, nivolumab, stops working, there's no way I'm going back to chemotherapy. And I think that in, the, in that uh, circumstance, um, we can, can consider giving him a TKI uh, and offering something meaningful if he still uh, wants to take it. So